Uh, dear colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, we are very happy and honored to have uh, with us Professor Zohar uh, from Israel. Uh, Joseph Zohar is uh, a world expert in uh, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. Uh, and also in anxiety disorders and uh, PTSD. Uh, he has served uh, as uh, chair of the European uh, College of Neuropsychopharmacology and currently he is president of the International College of Psychopharmacology, uh, among other uh, positions he held in the past. He has uh, numerous uh, uh, publications and international awards. Uh, so we are uh, here to hear you, uh, Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind word. Uh, let me see how we can start. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about standard of care of obsessive compulsive disorder. And basically, so, uh, you know, I think everybody in the audience encounters sometime with uh, obsessive compulsive, and you see that there is the tendency to check and check again and again. And basically the core pathology in OCD is the certainty. Individual with OCD, have the urge to be 150% certain that what they are doing is okay, what they are doing is fine. Uh, in DSM-4, OCD was part of anxiety disorder, and it was part of it, you know, in, in DSM-4 anxiety disorder include PTSD, GAD, phobic, panic, and OCD. Moving forward from DSM-4 to DSM-5, uh, the point was to find a biological validators for the diagnosis to get some sort of external validation, not to rely just on the symptoms, on the phenotype, on what we see, but try to look underneath. And this is what we call endophenotypical approach, which is basically, if you look at endophenotypical approach, uh, we are not, focusing on express behavior, on the phenotype, on what we see, on the symptoms, we know that at this point of time, we are not uh, able to get to the bottom of this uh, and to get the true genetic environmental et etiology. So what we are doing is we are looking at something in between the genetic in, in the environment and the express behavior. And the way to do it is to look, let's say, at brain circuitry or to look at cognitive function. These are two examples of what we call endophenotype. So instead, of focusing on the behavior, we look at the brain circuitry. And as all of you know, in psychiatry, uh, we talk mostly about brain circuitry, and we say, and what we are saying is that uh, that uh, uh, psychiatric disorder are related to some malfunctioning of specific brain circuitry. In OCD, the brain circuitry is very well known. And if you can look at the yellow line, this is the circuitry of OCD, which is prefrontal, temporal, temporal co cortex, 
Talamo Basel Gal Kilia circuitry. So this is basically the circuitry in OCD. And uh, based on this very specific knowledge of the circuitry of OCD, there was a possibility in the past to do neurosurgery. Since we know that this in OCD, there is hyperactivity of the circuitry and via neurosurgery, specific neurosurgery, we can block this hyperactivity. Nowadays, there are more sophisticated method, which include DBS, the brain stimulation, again, based on the knowledge of the specific circuitry, we can implement devices that interfere with the hyperactivity. And based on this specific knowledge, uh, the use of TMS, transmagnetic stimulation, also has been uh, used in OCD. Anyhow, going back to uh, the point of uh, this talk is the endophenotype. Had OCD been part of anxiety disorder, the expectation is that other anxiety disorder would have more or less the same brain circuitry. Looking at other brain circuitry, we see that as opposed to OCD, which is basically cortico-basal abnormalities, in GAD, in social anxiety, panic, the, it's, it's limbic circuit abnormality. So in this regard, the brain circuitry, looking at brain circuitry, does not support putting OCD together with SAD, panic, or GAD. We can also look at other component, which is the cognitive function. And basically the cognitive function has been proposed as part of the ARDOC, Research Domain Criteria, a project that was initiated by the NIMH and uh, basically call for updating the way of the diagnosis Again, not focusing so much on the symptoms, but trying to look underneath the symptoms. So let's say just to give you some illustration about this, in depression, uh, the, the cognitive style is emotional bias, or to be more specific, negative emotionality. If you want, it's like looking at the half empty part of the glass. In anxiety, we talk about fear extinction as the cognitive style. Now, if we move into OCD, in OCD, what we think is the cognitive style is what everybody knows is cognitive inflexibility. For individual with OCD, it's very difficult to change the way of the way that they operate. And there is a specific test called reversal learning. Basically, you know, what you do is you give individual a test and you say these are the set of rules that you need to operate in order to do this test and then in the middle of the test they say no now we are changing the rules and instead of doing this you're doing it this way you're doing it this way and for OCD individual it's very difficult because they have this cognitive inflexibility, they have this very habit formation, very important part of the, uh, of the pathology. So looking not only at the circuitry, but, look, but looking only 
also at the cognitive component, what we see major difference between anxiety and OCD. And this was the basis of the changes of the classification changes in anxiety in DSM-5 and also in ICD-11. So basically in DSM-4, as I mentioned, OCD was part of anxiety disorder. Uh, so this was one family. In moving on to the DSM-5, uh, anxiety disorder is not anymore one family, but three families. It's the classic anxiety. We got also the stress related, which include the PTSD. And in OCD, there were two changes not only one, two changes. A, the first one it was that OCD was removed from anxiety. It's not anymore part of anxiety disorder. And the second change is that it's not only one disorder, but it's OCD spectrum disorder. So let's talk about OCD spectrum and related disorder. OCD spectrum include on top of OCD include BDD, body dysmorphic disorder, hoarding, trichotillomania, air pulling, excursion, skin picking. So it's not only this disorder, but based on the endophenotype, the external validation, it was decided to include uh, on top of OCD, uh, include more disorder, which in DSM-4 is called OCD spectrum. In ICD, the uh, concept, they, they take the same concept, they adapted the same concept, it's OCD, obsessive compulsive or related disorder. And here they got also BTD, uh, but uh, they got other disorder olfactory reference and hypochondria. So now if we compare uh, it between DSM-5 and ICD-11, we see that in DSM-5, we call it OCD spectrum. And in ICD-11, we call it related disorder, but it's basically the same. In both, they have BDD and holding uh, as related or spectrum. In DSM-5, they got trichotillomania and skin picking. And in uh, ICD-11, they include also the olfactory reference and hypochondriasis. Uh, so basically, uh, in ICD-11, on top of trichotillomania and skin picking, which are uh, included in body focus repetitive behavior disorder, they have another two, olfactory reference and hypochondria. If you think about it, one way to conceptualize where OCD belong in the big picture is that it's basically, and some people talk about it as behavioral addiction. Individual have the urge to do the rituals. And if you, and if we look uh, and we see there are a lot of similarities between substance addiction and behavioral addiction, and, the, and this have a lot of implication for the way we treat uh, OCD, the similarity between behavioral addiction and substance addiction, and we'll talk about it in a couple of minutes. 
Now, if we look at the prevalence of OCD, the prevalence of OCD, usually it was considered to be around 2% in the general po population. But this is the prevalence only of OCD. So if we look now at the prevalence of OCD and OCD spectrum or OCD related, we see that the prevalence in, you know, while taking into consideration, of course, the comorbidity, the prevalence is about 9% in the general po population. And in this regard, turn out that OCD is more prevalent than we tend to think. And again, we'll talk in a couple of minutes why it is difficult to make the diagnosis. Now let's move to another important issue uh, that has changed moving from DSM-4 to DSM-5, and this is the distinction between obsession and delusion. In DSM-4, there was insight specifier. And basically, it was expect from uh, <clears throat> the psychiatrists who are doing a uh, mental status to, to specifically look at the insight. Classically, OCD is considered as ego dystonic disorder. The individual recognized that the obsessive compulsive disorder beliefs are definitely or probably not true or that they may or may not be true. This is basically the ego dystonic part. And then in TSM4, they have two insights. Individual thinks that the OCD believe are probably true, i.e. moving from ego dystonic to ego syntonic. This has been changed in DSM-5. In DSM-5, we still got the good or fair insight. We got poor insight, but we also got absent insight, delusional belief. The individual is completely convinced OCD belief are true. So delusional and still being OCD. And this is very important conceptual shift. In DSM-4 and before DSM-4, there was psychosis with delusion and what they used to call neurosis. And basically the point was that there was no delusion if you suffer from anxiety. If you suffer, for, if you got delusion, it, you should move, the patient should move to psychosis. This has changed in DSM-5. In DSM-5, you could have delusional, but still be diagnosed as OCD. So basically delusional belief and OCD, OCD with so-called psychotic feature, delusion, is still OCD. Just let, let me give you a short example about this 32 years old female married with two children, chief complaint depression secondary to husband infidelity and husband plan to divorce her. Further history, she's calling the husband again and again and again, more than 20 times a day to investigate what he is doing. She hired a couple of private surveillance detective to no avail. They come back to her and told her, your husband is fine, he's working very hard, he's totally loyal to you. And each time the husband uh, come back home, she's checking his clothes for sign of air, lipstick, etc., just to make sure uh, that 
uh, it is not that he is loyal to her. So what is the diagnosis? The classical diagnosis would be pathological jealousy. And then, you know, and then the next step is that it could be either delusion or could be obsession. If this is delusion, if this is obsession, then the treatment is with serotonergic reuptake inhibitor. If this is delusion, the treatment is with dopamine blocker. If this is obsession, then you do exposure therapy. If this is delusion, you do support therapy. <clears throat> the exposure therapy in this case is, let's say, to prevent her from calling the husband to prevent her for asking the husband again and again. So this is an example of individual that suffer from OCD. We skip the second one for sake of time and we move to uh, basically how we can in the clinical F, in the clinical setting recruit the endophenotypical approach to make the differential diagnosis between patholog in pathological jealousy between OCD and psychosis. And then you can, if you look at the patient, uh, you see that there is cognitive inflexibility, then it leads you to OCD. If there is impairment of thought, process, then it's more, take you more to delusion. <clears throat> Another way to do this differential diagnosis between the patient and the family and, and between OCD and delusion is usually in OCD, it start initially as ego dystonic and as time goes by, then it moving into ego syntonic. The delusional. Now let's move to the third point, the pharmacological management of OCD. OCD is unique. This is the only disorder in which only serotonergic medication are effective. So basically, if we look at the list of uh, medication here, what we see here that all of this medication are serotonergic medication. <clears throat> and basically, if you'd like to um, know what is the first line treatment in OCD, the pharmacological first line treatment these are all the medications that are effective. These seven medications are effective. No other medication uh, are effective in OCD. No other energetic medication are not effective. Here is a study that look at no other energetic medication, dizipramine versus serotonergic medication, fluvoxamine. And as you can see, looking at Y box, Y box, Wheel Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale measure the severity of OCD. If you look at Tizipramine, you see that this is very effective medication for depression, for, for panic, totally not effective in OCD, while fluvoxamine is effective. What else is different is that as you can see at eight weeks, we have not yet reached the plateau. To get the maximum effect in the treatment of serotonergic reuptake inhibitor in OCD, the maximum effect take several months. So basically it, you get the plateau after three to four months. 
Another difference is the dose. In OCD, you do need higher dose. Basically, and this is true for all the medication, especially true for OCD, there is no absolutely correct dose. It depends on age, on weight, on general health, on concomitant medication uses, tolerance, slow versus rapid drug metabolizers, and in the case of psychiatry, also on the penetration of the BBB. So it's not like one size fit all, but in OCD, it's even take us one step further. In individual with OCD, and here you see some, uh, the practice guideline for treatment of patients with OCD, that was uh, part of the American uh, uh, Psychiatric Association uh, guideline, as you can see, Many times you do need to go to very high dose in order to reach the uh, therapeutic effect in OCD. Usual dose are not effective in OCD. Let's say there was a study that looking at fluoxetine 20 milligram and paroxetine 20 milligram could not find difference between 20 uh, and placebo in OCD. Only higher dose were effective and the times you need really to push the dose to very high dose. So in OCD, there is unique response to serotonergic medication. You need to wait longer to get the maximum effect and you need higher dose in order to get the uh, desired therapeutic effect. We can skip this for sake of uh, uh, time and, and uh, move to uh, another specifier, which is past or present history of tick and the turret. <clears throat> In uh, DSM-5, they add another specifier, tick-related specifier. Basically, the idea is that uh, the individual, you need to specifically ask and specifically look at the patient and see if this individual has lifetime history of tick. And this is important because tick related is specific clinical characteristic, early onset, male predominance, high rate of symmetry, obsession of symmetry and exactness or ordering and arranging. And what is even more important is they have specific response to augmentation with dopaminergic medication, as you can see in this meta-analysis. If we look at the classical study <coughs> of McDougall, what we see is that if you only if you add small dose of dopamine blocker, in this case alloperidol, only then you get decrease in the severity of obsessive compulsive symptoms as measured by the Y box. So is there a role for dopamine 2 antagonist or partial agonist in OCD? Yes. There is a role, and basically what we recommend is to use small dose of aripiprazole, let's say 2.5 milligram, or re, uh, a, a other dopamine blocker, uh, risperidal half a milligram, because only then you don't only get control of <coughs> the ticks, which is important, but what is more important is that you get this decrease in obsessive compulsive symptoms, as you can see here. <coughs> now let's move <coughs> to the last part of the talk. Assessment of fa family accommodation. <coughs> 
And uh, it's now taking us back to what we talked initially about the um, addiction and the similarity between addiction and OCD. So let's say you got a, ch a child that uh, would like to go to school, that is planning to go to school. And the mother or other family member know that if he touch the doorknob, he need to wash. And then the washing is going on and on and on because of the obsession. And then he is going to be late for the school. So many times the mother say, I will open the door for you so that you will not need to wash. Or I will close the store for you that you will not need to check. And this is, uh, if you treat OCD and you get this type of family accommodation, it's going to uh, block the ability of the patient to respond well for the therapy. We skip this in, for sake of time. Let me conclude. Uh, the obsessive compulsive, uh, if we look at the prevalence, including the uh, related disorder, then is around 9%. And uh, there is very strong, and we don't have time to talk about it in, in our studies, in other studies, if you look at the family uh, loading, you see that about two thirds of the family got OCD. So the genetic component in OCD is very prominent. Prevalence of ticks is around 30 uh, percent in first and second degree family member. And comorbidity of tick associated with higher prevalence uh, in other disorder. Okay. So to conclude the talk, DSM-4, one family, anxiety, OCD was part of anxiety, DSM-5, OCD was removed for anxiety, and it includes not only OCD, but OCD spectrum. And if we look at the OCD spectrum and compare OCD spectrum and OCD related disorder, uh, what we see that OCD is not only one disorder, but there are another uh, five different disorders that are linked to OCD based on the end of phenotypical approach, which include BDD, hoarding, body focus, repetitive behavior, which include air pulling and skin picking, olfactory reference, and hypochondriasis. What is unique? for OCD is that there is specific effect of serotonergic medication, only serotonergic medication are effective. So basically all the medication that works for OCD are medication that work for depression and anxiety, but not all the medication that work for anxiety and depression work in OCD, <laughs> only the serotonergic medication. Again, very challenging diagnostic issue. OCD with so-called psychotic feature is still OCD. Many times individuals who suffer from severe, uh, incapacitating, bizarre type of OCD are getting diagnosed as schizophrenic, while they actually suffer from OCD with delusional belief. And then, of course, each time that we are seeing or looking at OCD, we need to look at a tick because in case that you got OCD plastic, <laughs> serotonergic medication most of the time uh, is not enough. You still need to give high dose <clears throat> of serotonergic medication, but you need to have small dose 
very small dose of dopamine partial agonists like aripiprazole. And uh, <clears throat> the treatment in OCD could not be, uh, could not lead to maximum effect unless you take, uh, evaluate environmental effect like Eden family support. <clears throat> Last point is the diagnosis. And because OCD is so prevalent, <clears throat> each time that you're doing mental status, make sure to include this specific five question. Do you check things a lot? Do you wash or clean a lot? Is there any sort that keep bothering you that you'd like to get rid of but cannot? Do your daily activity takes a very long time to finish? <clears throat> and are you concerned about orderness or symmetry? If you don't include this simple five question that takes a couple of seconds, then because of the ego dystonic nature of OCD, uh, many times you'll not be able to catch or to diagnose OCD, although it is there. This, you know, this uh, five question that was initially done in uh, English were uh, uh, studied in German and were found to have sen sensitivity in other languages uh, too. So basically, this is if this is what you remember from this talk, and if you include it in next time that you're doing mental status, this would be very good. Uh, okay, I think we can skip this, and this would be the end of my talk for today. Thank you, and open for question or any discussion. Uh, <clears throat> Joseph, uh, that was a very comprehensive and excellent talk. Thank you very much. It was it is a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Uh, we have one question uh, concerning the, the general uh, um, importance of uh, delusions in uh, non-psychotic disorders. For example, uh, uh, the question says, uh, if a person starves themselves to a point of physical compromise because of a paranoid delusion of being poisoned, we say delusion, but if people starve themselves because they see themselves as fat, we don't call it a delusion. I often feel the anorectic beliefs can reach delusional intensity for some cases. I, I, I don't think this is a question directly uh, related to the topic, but it, it, uh, it indirectly uh, questions whether delusions are the dominant uh, feature that puts the diagnosis. Yeah, I think it's very good point. And uh, as I mentioned, it's really a challenge to uh, diagnose at times to make diagnosis of OCD. Usually the tendency would be to, you know, to say, well, this patient is like, is more schizophrenic than OCD. But let's say in the case of anorexia, and we encounter a lot of uh, individuals that were uh, actually um, diagnosed as anorexia, but actually what the mechanism was either BDD or that they have difficulty in eating a lot of different food and this is part of OCD at times because of OCD, you have this disgust based on the structure or the way the food looks like and so on. So basically, and if you actually, if you look at the Y box at the Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale and um, try to compare the answer and the severity between anorexia and OCD, many times you don't find difference. And the same is true for people that can look like paranoid, but actually what they are concerned of, what the point for them is uh, whether or not somebody is looking at them because they feel that they look strange 
or bizarre or that they walk in, uh, they obsess about the way they, they walk or these kind of things. So basically, um, what I suggest, and this is taking us to the heavy genetic loading, part of the way that you can make uh, the differential diagnosis is look at the family genetics. And if there is like in two thirds of the cases, every genetic loading of OCD, then it sort of lead you more toward OCD. One point about the genetic loading and how you ask this, because OCD is underdiagnosed anyhow, the question is not whether somebody in your family was diagnosed with OCD, the question should be whether somebody in your family behave in a way that you think that is related to what, you know, the way that you are uh, behaving. So it's not about the diagnosis. And then of course you got deeper into this and then you see many times that there is what we found in this study and what other found that two thirds of the family suffer from this. So the second question, Marina. Uh, the second is what's the relationship and the comorbidity between OCD and uh, bipolar type one? <clears throat> so this is a interesting question. And um, it seems like there is overrepresentation of OCD in bipolar. And uh, in a way when this individual become uh, manic, they don't care anymore about the OCD. And in this regard, and since, you know, as we mentioned that serotonergic medication are effective, uh, in this regard, we put more um, or trying to treat this patient focusing a little bit more on the ERP, on exposure and response prevention, which is part of CBT, but specific part of CBT. And if we decide to give serotonergic medication, we are doing it, uh, you know, uh, with uh, after the patient are, uh, have been put on a mood stabilizers. Uh, the next is uh, what other psychopharmacological options there are for refractory OCD? Yeah, <clears throat> so refractory OCD, you need to look very carefully, as I mentioned, about family accommodation. If you give the best treatment, if you're doing everything right, and then but you're seeing the patient or you're doing the ERP only one hour, two hours a, a week, and there is family accommodation 24 seven, it's not going to work. <clears throat> so basically, before you declare somebody that is refractory, you need to pay very close attention to family interaction and instruct the family how, let's say, not to answer reassurance question many times patients in order to get you know to get to get the the uh, part of the ritual is to ask lot of a question and if somebody participate then it's uh, keep the vicious cycle of obsessive compulsive obsession rituals and so on so this is part of this if this is refractory again you can increase the dose of serotonergic medication to very high dose and um, in very, very rare cases, you can try to go to this uh, uh, a, um, a other type of intervention, uh, DBS. But I would, uh, before moving into this um, and the complexity of DBS, what I would do, I would give very close look at family accommodation. Mm -hmm. The next question is uh, <clears throat> similar. Uh, what are the augmenting agents? Uh, what class would be? And what is the, uh, uh, the evidence base for this? <clears throat> yeah, the class, you know, the augmenting agent, as I mentioned, uh, 
in case that you you got ticks or even not, but you know if you got ticks, it clearly su suggests that the augmenting should be with small dose, very small dose of dopamine partial agonist or dopamine uh, uh, blocker. And the beauty of this is the following. You see the effect of let's say 2.5 milligram of, of uh, aripiprazole in two weeks. So basically you give very small dose of uh, aripiprazole 2.5 and if in two weeks you don't see effect, then it's not working. It's not like uh, that it takes several months before you get effect with serotonergic medication. With the dopamine partial agonist, the dopamine blocker, you get the effect after few weeks. So no, no higher dosages? No higher doses, no, no. I mean, you know, basically what, what you really need, and this is take us to other, you know, effect of this medication, we know that there is, let's say, difference in the effect of small dose of aripiprazole versus I dose. In small dose of aripiprazole, you get, basically what you get is a release of dopamine. And this is what, what you'd like to get. And the same is true for small dose of uh, other dopamine blockers. I, I don't have this. time to go into the, into the concept of DDDP, different dose, different pharmacology, but let's say just, just to give you another example, if you give small dose of sulperide, of amisulperide, it's uh, actually helped to treat depression because it's dopamine releaser. If you give high dose, then it's dopamine blocker and then it treats psychosis. So same medication, depends on the dose, different pharmacological effect, different in, in the education. I have a little bit different uh, opinion on that view. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, uh, for example, in bipolar depression, uh, the prevailing opinion is that uh, you need low dosages and that high dosages of antipsychotics do not work. Uh, and this is why Zipracidone and Aripiprazole trials failed. But in fact, for those agents which were proven successful at low dosages, when higher dosages were tried, they were also uh, efficacious. So I'm not sure about that. And for amisulpride, I have heard it again for sulpride and amisulpride, but the data are, are a little bit uh, problematic. So I'm not, I'm not really convinced of that. Anyway, uh, we, are, we know that uh, low dosages of partial agonists would work on OCD as augmenting. Uh, yeah. So yeah. This, is the first, this is the first option. Yeah, the first option is, is giving partial agony small dose. Small dose. And uh, this is very important because it really makes the difference between somebody who is going to respond and somebody who is not going to respond. And in this regard, it's very important while you are uh, doing the mental status for the patient to look at the patient to see sign of ticks. Many times the patients are not aware that they have ticks and you need to look at them very carefully and see if they got ticks, including vocal ticks. So if somebody is coming to my office and they <clears throat> all the time, it gives you some suggestion that it, is, might, that it might have uh, vocal ticks. And then it can help you to direct, to be more precise in the pharmacological approach. Uh, and the next question is uh, concerns OCD in adolescents with uh, uh, autism spectrum disorder, which is not usually uh, responsive to uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And uh, what the question concerns the endophenotype and uh, uh, what is the uh, appropriate treatment option here? So. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, regarding autistic, you know, OCD, obsessive compulsive behavior is part of the of 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 uh, autism, and my experience and other experience is that uh, actually serotonergic medication are very effective there, including uh, behavioral approach. And since you know uh, many of these individuals suffer from autism, 
uh, are really very consistent in what they are doing, many times behavioral approach, you know, and, and the way they are following this uh, turn out that uh, the OCD part uh, uh, usually respond very well to combination of serotonergic medication and behavioral approach. And uh, so if you got individual with autism, at least from the part of the comp obsessive compulsive behavior, you can get a lot of help and a uh, decrease of the obsessive compulsive symptoms if you treat him uh, properly. With, with uh, five dosages as, uh, as recommended? So, you know, basically you can start and this is what you should do. You initially start, you don't usually need to go to super high dose, but you still need high dose. Also in these patients? Yeah, also in this patient. And uh, at least, you know, it is amazing to see how this patient responding well, according to my experience. And there is some evidence in the literature too. And the last question is, uh, what's the relationship of OCD with stress and the COVID pandemic? How these people reacted to the pandemic? Yeah, so this is a very uh, interesting point. We studied this and basically we look at individual with contamination uh, during the pandemic and ask them whether or not they were, you know, the, you know, the pandemic penetrate into their obsession. And it did not. So basically, you know, patient, and we see it in other cases too. So when there is, uh, so basically the individual with OCD, there was no, even, you know, individual with uh, washing ritual or contamination were not uh, affected by the COVID. They were, uh, you know, they continue on with their regular OCD. And it was, and the pandemic did not uh, penetrate to their obsessive compulsive symptoms. Now, what we see, we see individual that after the pandemic, the COVID is part of the subject of their OCD. But this was not the case during the pandemic. So it's a different, uh, different uh, way of relationship uh, depending on the stage of the pandemic. It depends, yeah, it's basically the OCD is there and the um, external input regarding the OCD is not immediate. Uh, the, uh, do their uh, contamination rituals increase uh, in the long term? I mean, after the, uh, uh, now the pandemic is officially, officially finished. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, I mean, uh, does no. this affect the, uh, no. re resists, continues? No, no, basically, you know, basically what we see is that there is, of course, relationship between the external wall and the OCD. So let's say, you know, if you, if you, if you have uh, certain uh, beliefs or certain religious, you might develop obsession or compassion that related to the specific uh, religious. But if you look underneath this, what you see is that the, you know, the checking, the need for certainty, the what if is really the leading factors. And the other component is just, you know, on, on the surface. It's not part of the core symptoms. Okay, I, I don't see any other question. Joseph. It was a great pleasure. It was a great honor to have you 
uh, with us tonight. I hope we'll, uh, we will be able to have more uh, webinars like this to, uh, to get deeper into OCD, which is one of the most devastating disorders in uh, mental health. Thank you very much. You're very Thank welcome. You. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all for being here with us. Take care.